good evening all welcome to today's discussion on future skills and competency for 21st century engineers today we will get to know more about this topic from dr sriram devanathan who currently serves as the principal of amrita school of engineering bangalore who is also the professor at the department of chemical engineering and material sciences he came to amrita with more than 10 years of industrial experiences at the 3m company in minnesota his areas of interest include low cost materials waste to energy technologies process intensification six sigma fault diagnosis empirical model modeling and so on dr sriram has significant expertise in cgmb and internal audit before getting into the session if you have any queries you can just type it in our chat box we will discuss it at the end of the session without further ado i would like to welcome dr sriram devanathan to deliver today's session Oh, Thank you so much, Om Namah Shivaya. A warm welcome to all that are gathered online here. So I understand that this session is for an hour and uh, we will have time for some question and answers also, I believe. So the topic for today, it has five key elements to it. And I thought I will go over each one. Now, what is the general focus of today's session? The general focus is this. For someone who is considering an engineering career or even other careers, non-engineering, how is it that they could go about planning their career? What would be the kind of resources they would require to help them? What would be the right time to start planning? And uh, what would be some of the challenges they may encounter in this process? And by knowing all of these, how then should they keep an alertness during the pursuit of their undergraduate degree or even graduate degree, postgraduate degree? These are the general focus areas for today. So as you can see, this is very general. So we will take five points one by one. The first point or the first main element of this session is about the career plan. What are some tips in terms of evolving a career plan? What is a career plan? How do you evolve it? Who would be involved in it? What's a good career plan and so on? Now in this, the career plan, as it says, so it says you have some profession or vocation in mind that is going to earn you your bread and butter. Now the same position may soon and very quickly bore you. It will also stunt your growth. And so you may be looking to grow in your career. You may be looking to grow in a personal way and I'll talk about a little bit more, which Amrita requires, not just the personal growth, something more. So that I'll talk about a little bit later. So you want a plan which will help you execute these aspirations. You should have some clear long-term objectives in mind. There should be a map, a road map, which tells you these are the places that I would visit in terms of my career, in terms of the positions, in what sequence, how long would I spend in each stop? So here a stop would be a career position. How long would I spend in each stop? How would I go from place A to place B? Position A to position B. These are the elements of a roadmap. A career plan essentially captures all of these. Now the tips for a career plan, what are some tips? To my mind, <clears throat> the starting place I think involves unconditioning of preconceived notions. I find today that a lot of people are mentally restricting their horizons, their mental horizons severely. Now what do I mean by that? So a person who is graduating, let us say, with a B.Tech in mechanical engineering, 
or a BTEC in triple E. But they have a certain next step and a next step and a next step in mind. So for example, they, they say core job or they say IT job, or they say, I will go for higher studies in India or abroad. Or they may say, I will apply for some management schools, B schools. So you see, these are all patterns that we have been taught. Maybe the student picks up from their senior who's picked up from their senior who's picked up from their senior. And it's all just handed down and it severely stunts our thinking. We severely limits our opportunities that we really have. <clears throat> so what do we do? The first question is to find out if I have certain specific interests, what are certain interests I have? Supposing you are actually in a BTEC triple E program, but you're extremely interested in dancing. Now you find out that uh, let's say just by virtue of dancing, maybe you don't have enough skills, uh, but you have extreme passion for it and you want to somehow be associated with it. What are your options? Suppose you are extremely interested, let us say in uh, music or movies, but you find you don't have any specific training or skills or talents in that regard. What can you do? What are your options? Does it mean you have to give up? The answer is no, there are lots of options, but it's just that we have limited ourselves to thinking that we don't have those choices. So what can we do? A very simple example, which may not really take much of a stretch of imagination. There are so many engineering students today who may have been forced by their parents to take up an engineering degree. And after that, they realized it's really not my cup of tea. So let me think about what else can I do? An easy transition that they've done if they have good communication skills is technology journalism. And it's not that difficult, but you must have interest. So my dear young friends, you can see that this word keeps coming up, the interest, the enthusiasm with which you take up your career plan. That's a very essential key ingredient, important ingredient. Without that, it's very difficult to proceed. The interest and the enthusiasm must be there. Now, how do you discover this? The answer is, Sometimes you may get it very quickly. Sometimes you may not get it. That's okay. Don't get all stressed about it. It's okay if you discover it a little bit later, if you discover it maybe a few years later, big deal, not at all a problem. At some point of time when you have it, you can always prepare for it, not an issue, but it's important to have that. So keep looking, keep looking into yourself and see where are my interests? For what do I have the enthusiasm? Now. As I said, in many cases, the parents may have forced them to take up engineering. And along with that comes a lot of baggage, mental baggage. And these preconceived notions have to be removed. So that is what I mean by unconditioning. So if you have gotten into such a situation, no need to get stressed out. Even with an engineering degree, there are tons of options after you finish. It doesn't have to do directly with manufacturing, it doesn't have to do directly with R&D. There are tons of other options. So first thing you have to do is start a homework project. Look at the internet, you have tons of information, but you see there's something even more uh, important, which is very, very practical. And that is make use of trailblazers. What are these trail blazers? Now that's a plural word, blazers, not blazer. So I'm saying there are many people who are pioneering. So they may have had a certain background, but they go off in a different direction. And suddenly the whole world wakes up and says, hey, I wish I could have thought of that. I want to do that. I want to go where this person is going. And so make use of them. These people are people who are creative and they've set a trailblazing um, precedent, if you will. They've, they've set a new direction for people to take up. And when you find such people, contact them. Now, many of you may not have the confidence 
you may think, oh, but I am just a plus two student or I'm just an engineering undergraduate or I'm just a postgraduate. These people are already well established. They are famous. They have a big position. Why should they even bother to tell me anything? Now that again is restricting yourself in your thinking. Don't think like that. There are many people in this world who are happy to share their experience and their knowledge. When you find such people, doesn't matter even if they are Nobel, Nobel laureates, write to them. Sometimes the answer may take a long time. It's okay, but write to them. Be that confident of yourself. And when you write to them, you may be surprised. Just one single tip from them may completely change the course of your life and change the course of your career. So think about it. Just one contact with an IAS officer or an IPS or an IFS officer one contact with somebody who's reached the architect level in IT industry, one contact with a top-notch professor who's got global reputation, one contact with a technical manager who's working in a top-notch Fortune 500 company, one contact with an R&D engineer who works in a top company, one contact with a technical journalist who's made a name for themselves. All these can really change the course of your life. So when you think about the career plan, first, your interest and enthusiasm, and two, unconditioning. Three, do your homework, identify what are potential areas, directions in which you can go. Four, make use of trailblazers. Identify the trailblazers, contact them, and you'll find a wealth of information that comes your way. And with these, you'll be able to construct your career plan. Now, I mentioned about the word roadmap. You may be thinking, why have I not really spoken elaborately about it? See, there is an upside and a downside to this idea of a roadmap. If I say, uh, I have a roadmap for you to start from a development, a software development engineer, and from there to get to a tech lead, and then to get to a project manager, and then to get to a production manager, and then to get to uh, whatever, I mean, you get to an architect or to a, a, a general manager, whatever it is. Now the problem is that is also limiting. So my dear young friends, those things are useful, but don't limit yourselves because I'm trying to get you to think beyond just these. There are so many other directions you might be interested in and which might really, really benefit you in your career aspirations. So the roadmap, like I said, it's useful, but do that when you are very clear that this is what I want to do. Suppose you say, I want to reach the architect position in the IT industry. Fine, then it's perfectly fine to, to do a roadmap and go ahead. But when you don't have that, if you are open-minded about the directions in which you can go, then don't start with the roadmap because it's going to limit you. So be careful about that. Okay, so that is the first part, the tips for a career plan. Now we move to the second one, which is about preparing for future trends. This is very important because if you have not prepared for what's coming in future, very simple, your competencies and skills may be outdated. You mean your services may no longer be in demand. So naturally for each person, there is a responsibility to anticipate what's coming, what are the trends in the world and to prepare ourselves accordingly, to upskill ourselves accordingly. And when we think about these future trends, I am not talking about just the technical part of it. So for example, there is this Gartner's hype cycle, which shows you the technology trends. I'm not talking about only that. I am talking about anticipating the impact of technology on culture, the impact of technology on learning, the impact of technology on your lifestyle, the impact of technology on health, the impact of technology on the education system, the impact of technology on the political system, all of these. How do we equip ourselves with knowledge of what's coming out there? 
And so the answer is very simple. You have to read. There is no shortcut to this. I remember a very, very classic case. I was teaching a class of PhD students, PhD scholars. PhD scholars, mind you. And so in the course of the conversation in this class, one of the students said, I hate reading. Now, it was a shock for me because if you are pursuing a PhD and you hate reading, how in the world are you going to survive or do well? Because you have to read literally hundreds and hundreds of papers. If you hate reading, what kind of reading comprehension will you have? What kind of critical thinking will you be able to apply? If you hate reading, how will you be able to prepare yourselves for these future trends? If you have to even read one article on the internet, you may have no patience. Now, all this is coming because unfortunately, we have become hooked to videos. So there are two problems. Now, in LKG, we are taught, the way we are taught is A for apple, B for boy, C for cat, D for dog, and so on. So what happens? You are shown an image, some symbol of an apple or a boy or a cat or a dog, and you are taught a particular sound like apple. A is a sound or a letter, a symbol. You are taught the image and you associate that symbol or the sound with the image. Now, this is in LKG. Now, if this is how we continue learning for the rest of our life, then we are no different from a chimpanzee because even chimpanzees can be taught this. A for apple, B for boy, C for cat, and so on. I'm not exaggerating. You can actually check it out on the internet. Chimpanzees are actually capable of this. But shouldn't we, as human beings who are much higher in terms of the evolution ladder, shouldn't we be doing more? How do we do this? And this is where it's absolutely compulsory to read books. I'm talking about novels. I'm not talking about some general reading or newspapers or, or biographies or, or anything like that. Novels, storybooks, absolutely important. This should be taken up from the second grade onwards. Every student, every child should be encouraged to read novels from the second standard. This is the only way. If you do not pick up the reading comprehension at that stage, you will fail to pick up meaning construction skills later. And you will still be always in that mode of A for, a for apple, B for boy, chimpanzees. And what happens when we see now the way communication happens, written communication happens in exam papers, in essays, in articles in the newspaper. I've seen some horrible articles on online, blogs, horrible. Absolutely no sense of grammar, absolutely no sense of formatting. They seem to think they can just pick up some words here and there from the dictionary and sprinkle it here and here. And it forms a sentence and it seems, and they think it makes sense. Now imagine what happens if you are like this and you go to the industry or you, you submit an essay in, in the class, what will people think of you? So you see, somehow we have to get away from this A for apple, B for boy mentality and create a much higher approach to learning. And that's where you have the meaning construction abilities. That's where you have the advanced reading comprehension. That's then leading to critical thinking. Without this, succeeding in life, gaining maturity of thought, being a thought leader, being creative, all these would be stunted. They would be severely impacted. What happens now with the advent of these videos? Number one. When you watch a video, you are watching somebody else's imagination. That itself is limiting. 
You are watching somebody else's imagination. You are not applying your own imagination. Second, what happens when you look at a movie, short film or a long film versus a documentary versus, <coughs> let us say, an advertisement, a commercial? What is the objective in each one of these? If it's a movie, whether it's a short movie or a long movie, the director and the producer, they have an objective to influence your mind in such a way that you walk away with the impression that you are entertained. But there's a very subtle influence that's happening in you, in your mind, in your emotions. There's a subtle influence happening in you. You don't even realize. And now when you come to the document, the producer of that documentary, they have a certain objective to convince you about a person, about a place. Maybe they are trying to project, let us say, a country or a city, about the beauty of a city, a country, or about, um, uh, about a person, all of these. They have a bias and they want you to pick up that bias. You may not even realize that you're being biased, you're being conditioned. The third one is with respect to, let's see, you have the movies, you have the documentaries, and then the commercials. Very, very clear. They don't even try to hide. They are trying to work on the mind to influence your thought patterns with respect to purchasing. Purchasing patterns, your shopping patterns, your the needs that you create in your life? What are the things that you consider as needed? What do you think is needed for you to live well? They are influencing it, whether it's Swiggy or something else. So now with all of these, where are you? Where are you? Are you just being washed away? So the question will be, where are you in all this? Shouldn't you be applying your critical thinking and deciding if this kind of conditioning is good for me or not. I should be the one deciding. So my dear young friends, this is where it's extremely important. Abandon that approach of A for apple, B for boy, C for cat. That's for chimpanzees, not for humans. So let us now take up very happily with great enthusiasm, a love for reading. And when I say reading, novels. Don't go after some self-help books and biographies and this and that. Enjoy your reading. And a very important tip, when you're reading these novels, never, never, never use the dictionary. Never. It'll just kill the joy of reading. Eventually, you're going to pick up the meanings just by virtue of the context in which you find that word. You'll get it. I promise you. You'll get it. But the minute you stop and say, let me look up what this word means in the dictionary, gone. You lose your interest. Don't ever do that. So now, before it's too late, do this. But however, if you decide movies, no effort, I just have to sit, I press a button, a movie rolls, and I just lie back, eat my popcorn, drink my Coke, and just let it roll. No effort. So why should I give up this and spend my effort turning pages of a book? Boring, that is what you might say. I'll tell you the secret. If you say you are bored, it means you are a boring person. Very important. You should think about this. If you say you are bored, it means you are a boring person. When you understand this, you'll never be bored in your life. I promise you. If you really understand the statement, a huge statement has huge impact on your life. If you truly understand this, you'll never be bored for it anything in your life. Again, I'll repeat that. If you are bored, it means you're a boring person. So now take that to heart and let me, I, I will have my hopes that nobody is bored in this life. Now, all of this I'm saying because it has to do with this fundamental aspect of taking shortcuts, laziness, because books, you may say, oh, it's boring. Now, remember what I just said. 
Second thing, that, that there is a little bit of effort to it, but movies, there is no effort. That is the thinking. That's all because of the conditioning. Now is the time for unconditioning all of this. And if you can do this, you'll find there are great rewards. So this is the first step. Now this first step, if you can do this, then there are three important points. One, who are the thought leaders in this world? Because they are the ones who are projecting future trends. Who are the thought leaders? Maybe you can look at a Tesla, you can look at Washington University and so on. So who are these thought leaders? You can look at uh, globally ranked institutes. You can look at uh, maybe some very, very innovative companies and the kind of products they have innovated. And then you look at that and you will get an idea of where is the world moving toward? So somebody had to have the thought leadership to say e-vehicles, e-mobility and so on. Somebody had to start. Who are the thought leaders? If you can start looking into them, then you will benefit because they've already thought about the future trends and you can benefit from looking at that and then see in order to ride in that train or on that plane, what kind of skills will I need? Because if I have those skills, it's like a password. They'll take me about the plane or the train. Then that brings us to this aspect, multidisciplinary skills. So all these future trends are very well. But unless I put in that effort and equip myself well with multidisciplinary skills, I will miss the boat. I will miss the train and the plane. Because in future, it's no longer about unidimensional skills. It's about multidisciplinary skills. Without that, definitely we would be left behind. Now, when I say it's not just about uh, saying, oh, I need computer science and math and electrical. No, no, not like that. It's about going a little further down to the foundations and looking at communications. It looks at uh, leadership, teamwork, and, uh, and, and looking at values, looking at uh, organization skills, um, looking at uh, the ability to integrate th things and form a system, looking at uh, the ability to be organized in your thinking. All these things are extremely important. And how do you prove this? If you attend an interview, how do you prove that you have these skills? Think about that. And for that, what do you do? Once you join the college, think about how am I going to develop my skills along these directions? What kind of project should I take? What kind of extracurricular activity should I take? That's how I would develop myself. And then I would be able to clearly document and prove when I go for an interview, look, this is how I, I picked up the leadership skills or the teamwork skills. Clear evidence, nobody can dispute. So this is in terms of preparing for future trends. The third key element is called engineering your engineering career. Now here, the word engineering is appearing twice. So what is this word engineering? There are two elements to this engineering meaning. One, the word design. And the second one, economics. So there is no engineering without design. And there is no engineering without economics. It's impossible. These two are absolutely essential ingredients when it comes to engineering. But there is one more aspect which today we cannot ignore and that is sustainability. So if we are thinking about this, naturally, if you want to engineer your engineering career, all three things must be there. Design thinking, economics, sustainability. So design thinking, there are so many wonderful courses that are created now where you can learn. Don't get left behind. Take this up. Even if you have to take this up along with your all other curricular courses, fine. At this stage, this four years, if you can put in that effort, it's a solid foundation for the rest of your life. Economics, this is where it's very important. Like I said, engineers tend to be a little bit narrow in their thinking. Don't say, oh, economics is some other field. It comes under humanities and social sciences. Why should I bother? That would be a big mistake. Economics is very fundamental to engineering. Without that, no engineering project 
or problem can be solved, can be completed with any effectiveness. Economics makes it all justifiable. Whatever you're proposing for an engineering project, whatever you're proposing for an engineering solution makes it just justifiable in, on a rational basis. <coughs> the third one, sustainability. Naturally, the world is absolutely insistent that we cannot ignore this aspect. And in fact, we should start this in all our projects, even the design thinking, integrate sustainability into the design. That would be ideal. And so if you have to engineer your engineering career, be aware of this. Are you developing the skills and the knowledge with respect to design, with respect to economics, and with respect to sustainability? All three are absolutely important. And then we have the fourth one, which has to do with holistic skill requirements. There are many organizations which value this greatly, but they are constrained to really put into practice or to implement the development of these holistic skills. It's very easy to talk, but how do you actually put it into practice? Holistic skills, holistic all round. Here is where I would encourage all our young friends who, are, who may be watching this program that you should shy away from thinking of yourself as someone who's enrolled, who will enroll in a degree program. Four years later, you get an offer letter for a company and you join that company and over. Now, is that all there is to life? Are you just an employee? Is that all there is to life? Absolutely not. So where do we start to break this chain? Where do we start to decondition, uncondition our minds about this? How did this happen? the severe stunting and constraining of our thinking to say, I'm just an employee. It is so limiting, so narrow. The foundation for this change, if we have to break this chain and if we have to change ourselves in our thinking, the foundation is this, what is my contribution? What is my contribution? to society, to the company, to the nation, to the world. What is my contribution? Have I thought about this? I can start at least by asking, what is my contribution to the company? In fact, you should be asking even before that, what's my contribution to the family? Or even while you are in school, what's my contribution to the school? Who says? that if you are a student, that you cannot contribute. Nonsense. That is severely constrained thinking. So this is the foundation for the change. How do I answer this question with honesty? What is my contribution to the family, to the company, to society, to the nation, and to the world? absolutely important. I am not just an employee. I am not. Okay. So now, once we have that foundation, and if we are convinced of that, the next question will be, how can you co-create a better working environment? I'll give you an example from my own experience. I was working in the US for a pharmaceutical and medical devices manufacturing plant. And before I joined, when they made an offer to me, they said, hey, Sriram, we are very glad to have you, but we also want to bring some things to your notice. They were trying to put it very mildly. They said, we've had a history of a lot of conflicts. So be aware, it's not going to be so easy working in this environment. I said, what happened? What's the reason for this? They said, well, you know, in a pharmaceutical industry, 
you have the quality department division and then you have the production department they will always be like this because the production department they are under tremendous pressure from the management to produce and to sell but the quality division they are under tremendous pressure to monitor the quality because here if it's pharmaceutical and medical devices somewhere if something goes wrong it's affecting a patient's health somebody could die so they have to take it absolutely seriously and they said this has been the source of friction and so i said okay i mean i somehow i heard that but it didn't really make much of an impact on me i wasn't really worried about it so i started and then i found that it was true on a daily basis these kinds of conflicts happen but then i found we were able to solve each day and keep going keep going then i after a few weeks i was thinking for years and years here's a situation where every day these kinds of conflicts are happening every day they are able to solve it so why the hard feelings why the stress right they they encounter the problems but they also have the solutions they have that capacity so why the stress so then i realized what is needed is to change that pattern of thinking that just because there are opportunities for differences of opinion it should not automatically mean stress because the differences of op of opinion are natural in this situation each person is doing their job they are not doing anything different they are just doing their job but the job itself requires this kind of difference of opinion it leads to that but there's nothing wrong there they were able to solve it so then i just started create creating small changes in the working environment very simple example so every day i used to post some humorous quote or some uh, witty saying or something on the door of my office you won't believe it within about 2 weeks everybody in the plant they used to make it a habit to come just you know wherever they are in the plant some of them will be very far away because it's a huge site every day before they start their work they come there they look at this just to start on a positive note they used to come and do this and one day if i forget or if i am very busy and i'm not able to put this they'll come come and say hey what happened to the code today that it became so popular within no time just in two weeks and i noticed something very beautiful that happened after that because this one factor united the entire plant so now you see all of them had one space of commonality that's all it took and that reduced the stress tremendously like this i tried implementing several things so we created an opportunity for uh, associating with ngos and uh, we did an event called a brush with kindness so there are lots of elderly people in society and uh, their children may not be with them they are alone senior citizens and there are things that may need repair around the house but they don't have either the financial means to do the repair or they don't have anybody nearby to help them or to paint the fence or something to paint the house and the walls so for such people we first went there collected the names and addresses went and met them and say would you like some help and they were very overjoyed they were very happy then you imagine we had about i don't know maybe about 400 people all of them were very happy 400 people who went around the city and painted fences painted the walls made repairs repaired furniture repaired the buildings all kinds of things imagine the impact and these people these 400 people were so happy that they could do something like this and when they came back to work they brought in that positivity so you see if you consider yourself just an employee you are stuck with whatever work environment there is but asking yourself what is my contribution to the company what is my contribution to society what is my contribution 
to the nation what is my contribution to the world that makes all the difference so in this context whether it's in a college or in the industry or in government service wherever you are ngo holistic skill skill requirements implies you ask this question and you answer it honestly what is my contribution this means you will not only have personal development the personal development will lead to organizational development the two together will lead to community development and the three together will lead to global development that's the beauty when you try to focus on the holistic skill requirements then we have the last one this last point i call amrita a place for real education the word real in quotes real education what is real education that means is there a false education what is real education now, this has to do with the previous point the holistic skills i mentioned about that whole concept of a, a for apple b for boy and so on the very very um, inadequate approach to learning which chimpanzees can do first thing is we have to go away from that and develop a love for reading once we develop very good reading comprehension you will not have to separately study for cat and gate and i mean not gate but cat and gre and all that automatically you will be ready people think that at some point of time preparing for gre means mugging up words and improving your vocabulary that is nonsense that is the problem now that's why we see horrible articles online or in newspapers the quality is so horrible so please don't fall into that trap develop reading comprehension the right way by reading lots of books develop a love for books then you will find your imagination blossoms because you are not watching somebody else's imagination your own imagination becomes so rich so incredibly rich you will become a trail blazer this leads to a very important aspect critical thinking this has become so important that there are now many colleges which are offering courses on critical thinking and i'm so happy to see that but i can tell you if you approach learning the right way develop a love for reading then this will greatly be facilitated the critical thinking aspect of it because you will learn to construct meanings in a rational way you will learn to love to dig up to uh, dig up the origin of words this is called etymology and there's so much incredibly rich learning to be gained from that etymology and then once you have this basis this foundation of reading comprehension and critical thinking to prevent us from being misguided to to enable us to be more empathetic to enable us to do our research and our other work in a compassionate way that's where we need the universal human values now many colleges offer this they aict is now mandated that all the faculty should also be educated on the universal human values but you see there is one problem after you undergo the training let's say a workshop for 5 days then what the problem is integrating all of this suppose you have an encouragement um, for some program for reading comprehension you have another dimension where you are trying to conduct some workshops and promote critical thinking and you have another dimension with respect to human values and then you have the technical knowledge and then you have the professional knowledge and upskill and professional skills and you have the life enrichment education but how do you integrate all this this is the beauty of amrita because the programs are designed in such a way the curriculum is designed in such a way the pedagogy is designed in such a way that these things are integrated however however if the motivation is not there from the student all this will fall apart there are no shortcuts my dear young friends no shortcuts you will realize sooner or later 
either accepting this upfront or receiving a lot of hard knocks on your head later. Sooner or later, you're going to realize, realize this. But there are no shortcuts in life. If you think there are, sooner or later, that's going to cause problems. Therefore, in Amrita, the way everything is designed, keeping spiritual values and universal human values in mind, thought leadership in mind, the company of inspired leaders in mind, the company of creative people in mind. How do we integrate all these into the learning on a day-to-day -day basis? That's what's being offered in Amrita. But like I said, you come here and you don't take advantage of this. You treat it as just any Tom, Dick and Harry college. Nothing will work. You will just think it's a Tom, Dick and Harry college. Where is the motivation coming from inside you? That's very important. Once you have that, that spark, that can be turned into a flame in this ecosystem within Amrita, this rich ecosystem within Amrita, this holistic ecosystem in Amrita. It can be turned into a flame. And that's where you can really take the benefit, complete benefit of being within this amazing institution. So with that said, I will stop and see if there are any questions and uh, take it from there. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, sir, for sharing this valuable insight with us. And now we are moving to Q&A sessions. So, sir, uh, first question is, what is the future of aerospace engineering in India? Thank you. That's a great question. What we find is that whether it is civil engineering, mechanical engineering, aerospace, etc., all these which traditionally come under the mechanical sciences and engineering category, there is, a, there is an interesting trend with these. You cannot really succeed unless you can pick up the skills and knowledge within the broad discipline of computer science and engineering. That much is clear. So the programs are also being shaped and revised accordingly. We don't want a mechanical engineer to say, oh, I'm going to take some um, Coursera courses on IT and so on. Okay, that's fine, they can do that. But really in order to give the students an advantage and to really prepare them, the very curriculum must be revised. Everything should be, this is where I talked about the word integration of the learning systems. Integration is very important. So if the trend in future, if the requirement in future is that they must be computer savvy, they must have the coding skills, the architecture skills, they must have all of these, the testing skills and so on. They must have the algorithm uh, design, all of these must be there. So in other words, you are creating someone who has the best of the computer science discipline and the aerospace and the mechanical and so on. That's the kind of curriculum that is being developed. So in future, uh, it is not that you as students need to do something, but the curriculum is being de designed that way. So you can actually benefit from it. You're in for some very exciting times. Yeah, sir. Next question is, um... To excellent field of AI, which career path would you suggest? Studying AI at UG level or studying computer science at UG level, then taking up at PG level? Okay, so uh, what I would like to say is, uh, as engineers, we often think that everything is black and white, that it's either like this or like this. This is where if you take uh, the humanities and social sciences, students and scholars and all that, they have a very different approach, with I, which I think is very beautiful. They say, don't look at the world as black and white. Always understand that you can examine something, you can observe something from many different angles, many different perspectives, and the learning becomes much better when you do that. So the answer to that question of AI, there's no one single answer. However, I know from talking to people in the engineering community, some thought leaders, that they generally, I say generally, they, they suggest that you have a broad-based foundation, a general foundation in 
UG, which means computer science, let us say. And then for masters, you can proceed with the specialization. So for example, computer science plus in MTech IoT and UG computer science plus MTech data science, UG computer science plus MTech AI, UG computer science plus MTech cybersecurity, UG computer science plus MTech robotics and automation, something like that. So those are uh, what I have heard as um, being recommended by the industry leaders. Yes, sir. Next question is, as we are offering the minus from this year, so one student is asking, is he degree with a biomed biomedical minor or is he with CSE is better? Uh, okay, so I think this question, it totally depends on your interest. It's not that one is better than the other. See, the again, uh, I go back to this, don't limit yourself into thinking that, you know, today, that uh, biomedical engineering students seem to get a higher salary or that AI students seem to get a higher salary. That's too limiting. So I strongly recommend don't think like that. Think from an interest perspective, because if you are interested, you will shine in any direction that you take up. You're going to shine. And you may far surpass somebody that you think is in an exciting area. You may far surpass, whether it's in terms of your professional success or salary or whatever it is. So please don't think like that. These kinds of comparisons, they're too limiting, very, very limiting. So I would suggest just be open about it. How is it that you can succeed? That is more important. So next question is, sir, how to balance? Yes, sir? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Please go ahead. So next question is, how to balancing our studies and uh, learning various curriculum? Oh, OK. <laughs> It's a great question and I know that a lot of people struggle with it and for whoever asks this question I should um, tell you and you might feel comfortable with this that even people who have been in the industry for 30 years they still struggle they still struggle now there are many reasons for this one of the reasons is they have not learned to be efficient now, efficient means you put in a little bit of time but you get very good results there are many people who put a lot of time and they don't get results. Why is that? So very simple example I'll give you. A student of mine was applying for higher studies in the US. And at some point of time, the replies from the universities were getting delayed. And then I told the student, can you please write to them and ask them if there is any additional information that we could give them? A couple of universities replied to him. And they said, well, you see, a lot of the students who have applied, they're very, very close in terms of their credentials, very close, maybe around the same CGPA, maybe around the same comparable college, all tier one colleges, um, similar SOP, similar in terms of extracurricular activities. And so we are finding it very difficult to decide. How do we decide? And then I told him, very simple, I'll tell you what we can do. In the Amrita system, you have the CGPA. Now, if you look at CGPA, we report up to the second decimal place. So uh, on a scale of zero to 10. But you ask yourself this question, some student who has a CGPA of eight and some student who has a CGPA of 8.01, are they really different? I mean, it's impossible to say that they are different. It just so happens now, no teacher in the world has the ability to distinguish like that on, at that scale of resolution. But it just so happened over the eight, eight semesters that in the, with the grades that they did, the marks that they got, they ended up like this. Now, if I look at it like this and say eight and 8.01 or 8.05, they're all the same. And I redo the rankings and I place the student in the new system, I place the student instead of saying that they are 15th in the class, Suppose I'm able to show them that they're actually in the top five. Now, suddenly the student has got an advantage, right? So I just explained this to that university and immediately they sent a reply saying, thank you, Sriram. We really appreciate this analysis. I was struggling to do the comparisons. So your analysis made it better. So you see, these kinds of common sense approaches are very, very important. When we pick, the, when we pick up these kinds of skills, Anywhere in the world, you're going to make an impact. Thank you.
Uh, thank you so much, sir. That's all from the student side. So thank you, sir, for sharing your valuable time, time with us. And thank you all for joining us today. Tomorrow, we are having uh, another webinar at 5 p.m. Uh, that is introducing minors and specialization at Amrita School of Engineering. So will you see? So we can see, see you tomorrow at 5 p.m. Thank you. Thank you all. Namaste.